Today on CityCast Philly, we're back with another midweek news roundup. We're going to run down recent headlines out of Philadelphia City Council, an update from one of the city's biggest summer markets. Plus, we've got another Philly trivia question to stump you with. It's Tuesday, March 26th. I'm Laura Benshoff, filling in for Trine Nari, and here's what Philly's talking about. Joining me this week is Abby Fritz, CityCast Philly's producer. Hey, Abby. Morning, Laura. Good morning. And Asha Prahar, the editor of our newsletter, Hey Philly. Morning, Asha. Good morning. Okay, so we're going to just jump right into some big news of the week. City Council, as you may know, meets every Thursday in Philadelphia. And last Thursday was a pretty newsy day. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with you, Abby. What's your update from uh, Philadelphia City Council? So what I've got for us today is about the Kensington business curfew. This was a big vote that happened last Thursday. Ketsi Lozada, who represents the 7th Council District, which covers parts of Kensington, introduced this bill that was unanimously passed. So basically, this this bill is going to enact a curfew for some Kensington Mm. businesses. It would be from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., and it applies to the businesses that are within the East Lehigh Avenue, Kensington Avenue, D Street, East Tioga Street, and Frankfurt Avenue area. I read in an article that this could affect around 90 businesses. Okay, wow. Yeah, it's, it's a lot, with the exception of businesses with a liquor license. So, you know, that's that takes out bars, at least, and places like that. So the, the types of businesses that will be affected will be places like corner stores, restaurants or takeout spots, smoke shops, and then even like tattoo parlors, if they like to stay open late down there. Council members said that they hope this bill will help reduce crime in the area and also even like littering, things like that. Um from what I've I've read on this topic, it kind of has mixed reviews from both residents and from business owners. Some people are very for it and have kind of already been doing this themselves. I think there was one tattoo shop owner that says he's been closing at 7 p.m. for a long time in this okay. area because it's just not doable for him. Other places are a lot more concerned with how this will impact their business and their business model. So how would this actually work, Abby? So Mayor Parker has to sign it first. So it's going to her desk okay. and it, everything is pointing towards that she will sign it. She's had a big focus on putting legislation out there lately that would hopefully help alleviate crime or the likes in Kensington. So it seems like she's going to sign it. And how they'd enforce it is if businesses don't comply, you get a $500 fine per day if you don't follow this rule. Super interesting. Curious to see what impact this law has. Another interesting thing that caught my eye last Thursday was a hearing in council. So this was a hearing on a law called Act 135. It's also Mm -hmm. known as the Abandoned and Blighted Property Conservatorship Act. And this act's been kind of controversial recently in Philadelphia. Some families here have been alleging that while it's um, sort of supposed to help neighbors take over a property that's abandoned, that's really an eyesore Mm -hmm. and causing problems in a neighborhood, that it's actually being used to sort of bully families out of their sort of like historic family homes or or bully um, property owners into turning over properties that maybe they're still in the process of saving the money to fix up or there's some sort of extenuating circumstance that hasn't let them fix their property up yet. We did an episode on this law back in January where we went sort of into some of these families' cases if folks are interested Mm -hmm. in going back in our archives and listening to that. But what happened last week is that city council sort of took it up and they pulled out more of these stories from local property owners. They had some local property owners testify. There were people testifying both for and kind of against the application of this law. And I should shout out the Philadelphia Inquirer. A reporter there, Samantha Malamud, who we interviewed, has done tons of reporting on this law and on this topic. And that, I think, is part of why it's come up before council now. So city council member Jeffrey Young took up this cause and convened the hearing last week. And there were a few people's stories who really stood out to me. One was a man named Raymond Johnson, and he'd secured money to fix up a house in this area known as Black Doctors Row on Christian Street, a sort of historic area. 
um, mm -hmm. only to lose that property through the Act 135 process. Another line that stood out to me, City Council Member Jamie Gautier, whose district encompasses like a lot of West Philly, said she's had to step in in her neighborhood to stop petitions filed against people who are actively living in their properties. Oh my and that's, yeah, she called it, quote unquote, traumatic and harassing. Wow. So that's interesting because that's definitely not how this is supposed to work. Yeah. It's supposed yeah. to be for properties that are abandoned that have not uh, been lived in for a year. So the fact that maybe these conservatorship applications or petitions are being brought against homes that are occupied just kind of feels like it's a little bit of a misapplication of the law. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. But Gautier sort of also said she supported the use of the law, Act 135, in certain cases. She gave an example in her neighborhood of a, a nuisance property that uh, you know, she and other folks in the in that neighborhood had tried to get fixed up or get an intervention for other ways, mm -hmm. and it just didn't work. So Act 135 was a useful tool. So it's interesting to mm -hmm. me that council's looking at this. It's a state law. I'm curious what they might be able to do. And it is also something that has sort of like a mixed track record, right? So maybe there are ways mm -hmm. to sort of tighten up some of these issues or sort yeah. of keep an eye out for the law being used in a way that some people say is predatory while also letting it be mm -hmm. used in a way that that can help, you know, solve blight properties in certain neighborhoods. So that was interesting to me. And then there was one other pretty big update from council on Thursday. Asha, I was wondering if you could tell us about it. Yeah. So also on Thursday, city council unanimously approved a bill that's been generating a bit of buzz. Mm -hmm. It's uh, about these casino style games called skill games, which are like digital terminals that some business owners have placed in their gas stations, corner stores and places like that. And on Thursday, city council approved a bill that would essentially prohibit these in certain settings. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. according to city and state PA, the legislation, which was introduced by Councilmember Curtis Jones, would allow these machines only in businesses that have a casino or liquor license, as well as an area for at least 30 customers to eat or drink. So that would, you know, you can imagine. Yeah, it. that like, knocks that, out a bunch of places. <laughs> yeah, like that would cut out a lot of corner stores. Like mm -hmm. how are, how's a corner store going to have a place for 30 people to yeah. eat or drink? That seems like pretty out of the question, given the format. Totally. Um, so it's definitely something that has been controversial and Pennsylvania law surrounding these terminals is currently kind of vague, um, mm -hmm. but courts have ruled that they're allowed. And Governor Josh Shapiro actually wants the Commonwealth to start formulating actual regulations on these machines. Mm -hmm. And he wants to do that so that the state could heavily tax the revenue from the skill games. Right. That's part and, of his budget proposal, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. But Philadelphia has definitely been seeing some opposition to them, which is what's prompted city council to be like talking about this issue and, um, you know, approving this bill. Right. Um, so the Inquirer has reported previously that some groups like law enforcement leaders and some community advocates, they think that these skill games are drawing crime, partially because people have to carry cash to play them and that mm -hmm. can encourage robberies, mm -hmm. or at least that's what they're saying. But, you know, business owners who have these terminals in their businesses, they're saying, like, this crime is already happening. And right. they're arguing that these machines are really important to their businesses and their livelihoods. I also feel like this really became a focus after a police-involved shooting in a corner store where some mm -hmm. men were, I think, using these machines. Do I have that right? Yes. Right. And I don't know, you know, if that incident was directly related to people using those machines, but it definitely kind of drew attention to to the fact that like they've really proliferated all over the city. It's like tons of corner stores now have these little gaming terminals in them. Yeah. And I guess, um, you know, so there are people who are for, there are people who are against. Yeah. Someone who would really fall into the against this bill, um, that category is obviously manufacturers of these mm -hmm. machines. Um, one of them has right. been really vocal about the issue and they're called Pacematic, the company. And they're actually threatening legal action against the city, according to wow. a statement that they gave to city and state PA um, after this bill was approved. So mm. it's kind of unclear from the reporting and from the statement what that will actually look like. But suffice it to say, uh, I think they're pretty fired up about it. <laughs> yeah, um, makes sense. It's their business model. For sure. And we actually have an entire episode about this skill game debate, if you want to go look that up in our archives. More news after the break. This is CityCast Philly.
Okay, so getting into some other news. Uh, one of the biggest recurring food events in the city, the Southeast Asian Market and FDR Park, was gearing up to start its season on March 30th, which is this coming weekend. If you're not familiar with this market, it has more than 70 vendors selling food from the Southeast Asian diaspora community. And it lasts like basically from the spring through the summer to the fall in Philly. It's a big deal. It's been written up a ton in local and national food press. Have either of y'all been to this market before I get to the update? Oh, yes. I love I, I live fairly close. So walking there in the summer is like favorite weekend activity. Go get some snacks and walk around the beautiful um, man-made lake. It's a beautiful setting. L- love, love this spot. Love this market. I can't say I've been yet. I know when you mentioned it on our monthly guide, Laura, I was obviously very intrigued. I mean, I'd heard of it before, but like you reminded me that it existed. And mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I, I don't really get down to FDR Park a lot. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, it's never really kind of been in the cards for me, but I, it's something that I want to go to once once it's opened, which is something that you'll talk about, I'm sure. (laughs) Yes. So as you mentioned, I was hyping this event up in our March guide. We do these monthly Mm -hmm. guides where you can kind of get a little preview of cool activities, free things, places to go get a bite to eat every month. And in March, I was like, the market, it's coming back, March 30th, it's about to kick off, everyone get ready. But then last week on the markets, Facebook and Instagram pages, they put out a sad message. It said, quote, Due to unforeseen circumstances, the opening of our market is delayed until further notice. We apologize to all of our supporters who have been patiently waiting since last year. We hope to quickly resolve this matter. Doesn't say what the matter is. So the opening Mm -hmm. has been postponed. Not a lot of details out there. A couple news Mm -hmm. outlets like the Philadelphia Inquirer and Philly Voice reached out to comment from Parks and Rec as well as the Vendors Association, which represents the different folks with their kiosks there. And again, did not get a lot of satisfying detail about why the market's been postponed. The Vendors Association told the Inquirer, quote, there are some requirements for the market to proceed, end quote. And that, quote, the circumstances leading to this delay are all necessary things that have to happen. Hmm. Again, not a lot being said there. Something must have been a holdup, don't know what it was, but I did see a lot of people on social media like me sharing that they are bummed that this is not back yet and looking forward to it actually opening. Now, a spokesperson from Philly Parks and Rec has told Philly Voice and other outlets, it's not getting moved back that far. The opening of the market is now, you know, ostensibly sometime around the end of April Mm -hmm. to fix whatever issue has come up. Um, But there is no new date yet. So we'll keep our eyes out for that. Um, And one kind of like silver lining is that the Southeast Asian Market's social media pages have been really promoting some of the individual vendors. So you can actually go follow some of those vendors and see if they're popping up anywhere before the market officially opens. And we can put that link in our show notes. So if you need that fix, Abby, before (laughs) before the end of April, maybe you can track down some of these folks individually. But I'm so impatient. You know I will. <laughs> yeah. I love just, a good pop-up. What's, what's going on? Um, <laughs> but anyway, hope everything works out and that they fix whatever the issue is quickly. That's just so mysterious. I know. <laughs> I've so many quotes that say so little yeah. <laughs> about what the actual problem is. It's very much just like, give us anything. Give us a little detail. What's going on? Okay, Asha, you are our resident quiz master. We're ready for some trivia. What is your Philly trivia question for us this week? Okay, well, uh, before I ask Mm -hmm. it, I have a question for you guys that is not trivia. It's just for you. So the NCAA's March Madness tournament has been going on for the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. Um, Are you guys college basketball fans at all or have you been paying any attention Oh, no. Ooh. Yeah, no. <laughs> Wrong crowd. Not, sure. <laughs> not enough. I Yeah, I, want, I read the headlines, but I have not committed myself to college basketball at this phase of my life. What about you, Asha? Are you watching? <laughs> I have been watching some of it. Uh, you guys 
know this, but CityCast, like the whole company is doing a bracket right now. And Mm -hmm. as of Friday, I was like number one in the men's and the women's. Wow. Um, But that was like very early on. Like they hadn't (laughs) even finished like the first round of of stuff. Um, Let's just say I'm not like after the weekend, I'm not number one anymore. I have (laughs) fallen dramatically because I I don't really follow sports of any kind. And I kind of just filled it filled it out for fun. Um, mm-hmm. And, like, I sort of just went with, like, colleges that were, like, I was, like, oh, the name sounds cool. Or, <laughs> like, I know someone who went there. Or, like, I went there. Like, <laughs> so I'm just, like, oh, I'll just, like, bet on, like, like, it's all, it's it's not. It's a vibes bracket. It's, it's, it's vibes. Fine. It's yeah. pure vibes. Um, Love that type of bracket. Yeah. And that worked well for, like, the first couple games. But after that, it's, it's, it's been downhill. Mm. Um but it's fine. Um, anyway, um, today's trivia is related. So good luck. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, awesome. So uh, as you may know, there's both a men's tournament and a women's tournament. Um, and these tournaments happen in host cities and venues across the country, not necessarily at the colleges that are like playing in the tournament. Um, so my question is about the women's NCAA tournament, mm-hmm. which hasn't actually always been branded as March Madness, um, but it has been going on for quite quite a few years. Um, so my question is, when was the last time that Philadelphia hosted the Division One Women's Final Four? Ooh. Oh, my God. It's going to be purely me throwing out numbers. I have no... I'm going to say 1984. No. <laughs> Darn. All right. More recent past or more distant past? (laughs) Uh, More recent past. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go vibes only 1996. You're getting you're getting close. You're getting warm. Okay. Is it 99? You're getting really, really warm. 2000? Yes. It was 2000. We did it. (laughs) I've got some bonus questions for you. Okay. Okay. Um, What venue did they play at? Mm, Do they have to play at a college venue or can they play anywhere? It doesn't have to be a college. Okay. I don't know. I was going to guess like the Leah Chorus Center, but I don't know if that's a college. I don't know if that makes sense. It was not there. They playing at the 76ers Stadium. At Wells know. Fargo? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Wells Fargo. So, oh, so really? they played at first. It was then called First Union Center, but oh, it's cool. now known as Wells Fargo. That's where wow. they played. Okay. That's pretty cool. How about another bonus question that I feel like you guys... These are all just us, like, feeling in the dark. (laughs) Okay, okay. And then I have, like, fun facts. I have fun facts after this bonus question. Okay, Um, So so we'll we'll all learn something here. (laughs) Uh, So what four teams were playing in that Final Four in 2000 at the First Union Center? I don't even know if I can guess this one. UConn? I feel like they're always good at women's basketball. That was one of them. That was one of them. All right, I'm retiring after that guess. (laughs) (laughs) How many teams does there have to be? You four. Said four. Final four. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, UConn was correct. I don't know. Like, Yale? I don't know. Like, who else plays? Like, is it regionally? Like, I don't know anything about this. So this is just <laughs> bad. You know, that's fair. I, I can just tell you guys. <laughs> okay, thank you. Please. Um, okay, so Connecticut was one of them, the Connecticut Huskies. Nice. The Penn State Nittany Lions were in it Woo-hoo. that year. Oh, cool. As well as the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. So oh, two schools sweet. that are pretty decently close to Philly. And then the fourth team was the Tennessee Volunteers. And Connecticut ended up winning the tournament. But yeah, this was it's it's really interesting. I was reading a little bit about this particular tournament and apparently tickets were super expensive to get Mm. into like the final four games. The Inquirer reported at the time that they were going for three hundred fifty dollars or so like at minimum. Yeah. Um, And in this article, there's a quote from the senior vice president and general manager of the venue, First Union Center, that said, quote, it's as hot a ticket as I've seen in a while. This is like an NBA or NHL playoff game in terms of demand or an in-sync concert. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much. That was Asha Prahar, our Hey Philly newsletter editor. Thanks, Asha. Of course. And Abby Fritz, CityCast Philly's producer. Thanks so much, Abby. Thank you, Laura. We'll have links to all of the articles and resources mentioned in this episode in our show notes. Thank you. 
that's all for today here on CityCast Philly. If you enjoyed this episode, running down a bunch of recent local news headlines, tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and hit that subscribe button. If you liked Asha's trivia question, be sure to sign up for our morning newsletter, Hey Philly, to learn more about what else Philly's talking about and take part in a few other fun quizzes and challenges we've got for you. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye.